Hello again, it is Crew Call here on Motor Racing Network. We are presented by Flow Racing, the new home of NASCAR Roots, and over 1,300 races that you can stream live and on demand. You can subscribe at flowracing.com. Steve Post, pit road reporter for Motor Racing Network, joined by 25-time and championship-winning Crew Chief in the Cup Series, Todd Gordon. Hello, Todd. How are you? I'm great. Another great weekend of racing behind us and one to look forward to. And, and what a great uh, guest we got coming on today. You yeah. Know, locked into the playoffs. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see what Chris's view is of everything yeah. going forward. Chris Gabart going to join us today. His fellow Joe Gibbs Racing Crew Chief, Adam Stevens, punched their, well, I don't know. If they, I, I don't know who's punched their ticket in now. They won a race. Yes. Which was good. Yeah. Winning a race is good. I'm not sure what it all means. A huge, huge win for Christopher Bell and Adam Stevens with that car. Yeah, definitely. I I, I thought that they were, you know, they had tons of speed earlier in the year. I thought they were going to easily punch their way in. The last month, I wouldn't have said so. I just didn't feel like they had everything that I, that I thought they needed to. And then what a great, I, I shouldn't have doubted this one. You look at Christopher's, you know, history at Loudoun. Yeah. Second last year in his only cup race there in won the three Xfinity races he ran up there. So I, I guess it's no surprise, but uh, boy, it's definitely, it's one more piece. It's, it's, it's challenged, you know, what, 14 winners now. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's created a lot of anxiety going in these last, uh, last five or six races. Rodney Childers and Kevin Harvick need to win to get in the playoffs. I don't know that I ever thought I would utter that phrase. And ninth in points. And they're ninth it's, in it's points. It's not like they're terrible. They're ninth in points and out of the playoff. Yeah. The bubble car right now is Martin Truex Jr. in fourth in points for the year. I And, and I talked to Blaney earlier this week. I, I mean, I talked to him weekly with, with the late shift. Uh, yeah, I'm serious. And, guess on there, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I, I mean, Ryan's a friend of mine, but they're not comfortable at all. No. They feel they have to win. And, and, and they, I mean, for him, he's got great racetracks coming up, but – they're third in points. They were they were second in points going into last weekend. They're third in points right now. They're they're within, I mean, reach of of winning a, a the overall champion you know regular season championship. And if they did that, they guarantee their way in. Sure. But I don't think they're going to do that on the heels of a lightning hot nine team right now. Right, yeah. So they're not guaranteed in, and they're, they're nervous about it. Third in points. They're on the heels of winning the regular season championship, and on the heels of not making the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Right there, because two more winners. I mean, and we've talked about it. Yeah, there, there's. I mean, two two more winners, and we've got well, Indy Road Course, we've got Watkins Glen, well, we've got Daytona. Okay, two winners could be Kevin Harvick and Martin Truex yeah, Jr. Exactly. Two top ten racers exactly. in points could put Blaney out. Eric Amarola. Yeah. Eric Jones. I mean, right. the, the list. I can go out and make well, an argument. Chris Busher on a road course, for, and then there's Daytona at the end of the line. Yeah, that's. A lot of sleep and stuff. Buckle you up are, and tune in because this is going to be a great. You picked the right year to get out of that crew chief business, my friend. You yes, picked I the did. right year to do it. Hey, I want to. Um, I'm going to call out Alan Gustafson. He came on here last week on Crew Call and just bemoaned the fact that they've never been good at New Hampshire. Yeah. They got to do this and they got. I'm sitting there going, Alan, what did you do? Because man, they figured that that's that, that's that's that's, that's, that's typical just a Alan sign right of a there. good team. Yeah. That's the yeah. sign of a good yeah. team. But yeah. last week. I kind of was just like, so what do you got in New Hampshire? And the next thing you know, it's like, wowsy, wowsy, whoa, whoa. I'm like, whoa, I mean, I wouldn't have asked that if I knew they were so struggled there so much. I figured they'd be pretty good when they had to go to the back. They had thought they yeah. had a loose wheel and they came back, put four on, and they still drove up into points position in stage one. So I yeah. uh, knew they were going to be good. I really thought the race was good. I, yeah. I, I had picked, I mean, I, I looked at it, thought Kevin Harvick was going to come out with a win. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was, Martin was really good all day, but Kevin on the longer run would come back. And you knew that that caution, that last caution flew with what, 90 something to go? Yeah. You knew that that was going to be the call. You know, in hindsight, I mean, we can all look at it. Loudon's been a place that you, I've often wondered, two or four. You know, there's there's times that track position plays bigger than tires do, but those two took two and it four got by them. And, and once it got, once they got by them, yeah, the dirty was, air, they were buried. Yeah, man. Crazy, crazy stuff. Great, great racing, that's for sure. As Todd mentioned, oh, yeah. No. Oh, you I'm had good. another? You had another no, that's, okay. that's sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that's it's, it's, I, I looking forward to talking to Denny here. Yes, absolutely. So Chris Gabehart, crew chief for Denny Hamlin, is going to join us, and we look forward to that conversation. You can subscribe to Flow Racing, the new home of NASCAR Roots. Catch NASCAR Wheel and Modified. Arkham Menards, Pinty, and NASCAR Weekly Tour Races on flowracing.com. You can subscribe today. The headliners this weekend, 
the NASCAR Pinty Series from Edmond International Speedway. And how about this? The NASCAR Late Model Stocks, the Hampton Heat 200 up at Langley. This is part of the Virginia Triple Crown. And the Virginia Triple Crown, South Boston, that just had the um, Harley-Davidson 200. Uh, Corey Heim won that race. Mm -hmm. Okay, We're going to Langley, which is a great track over in the eastern part of Virginia. It's the Hampton Heat 200 and then the Martinsville late model stock race coming up at the end of the year. Those are the Triple Crown races. You can catch the Langley Hampton Heat 200 on Flow Racing. Weekly racing, the NASCAR Advanced Auto Parts Series, Autodrome Granby, Jennerstown, Riverhead, Langley, Bowman Gray, Lacrosse Fairgrounds, Meridian, Evergreen, Berlin, Hickory, All-American Speedway, Alaska Raceway Park that I mentioned. Between that and non-NASCAR action, over 1,300 races. There's a lot on there. Yeah, you, you, you have no reason not to get your full saturation <laughs> with flow racing. Yep. It's, uh, it's great great to bring the grassroots forward. Great. It really, truly is. And an advocate of grassroots, Chris Gabart. He joins us next. Welcome back. It is Crew Call presented by Flow Racing, the home of NASCAR Roots. Let's go to the hotline. Joining us from over at Joe Gibbs Racing is Chris Gabehart, crew chief for Denny Hamlin. Chris, 20 races into the 2022 season, and um, how are things going? How are you? How are things? And, and what's going on with that 20 team, or the, uh, the 11 team? The 11 team the 11 in 2022. In 2022. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> Too many numbers for radio. How are you and how are things going? There we go. <laughs> Uh, I'm good, guys. Thanks for having me on. Uh, man, the 2022 season so far has certainly been an exciting one, um, full of a lot of ups and downs for the 11 car. But I really think that's the story of of the first year with the next gen car, learning how to race it, how to set it up, what things matter, what things don't. Uh, and for us, execution certainly has been a big uh, struggle, to be honest with you. But when when we execute well, we are we are in contention and um, feeling good about where we're at. To be honest, yeah, the execution. The two races that you executed flawlessly. I got to I got to be in the MRM booth for Richmond. Uh, thought that was a great one and and really made an exciting race out of it. You talk about the uh, ups and downs and the execution and the pieces and the, and the mistakes and and stuff. But as I look at it, I feel like. Almost, it's almost a manufacturer execution that seems like it comes and goes. I was at Kansas and thought the Toyotas were dominant. I, every one of you should have run won the race. Uh, and, and then we go to certain races in, in Sonoma, and nobody was really, really competitive. And we've seen that out of the Fords as well. We've seen out of the Chevrolet some this year, but um, I, I feel like the, the Toyotas and the Fords, I, I've seen that come and go. Why is it, what drives it from a manufacturer standpoint? Well, again, I can only speak to Toyota. That's what I that's what I know best. But certainly when you're dealing with a new platform like the next gen car and you consider where all of the inputs for, for our resources come from with wheel force testing, that's a Toyota driven initiative. And our aero department here at, at Joe Gibbs Racing and Toyota has been the same for some time. It's a it's a very focused um, uh, department that that we all share the information in. So those are those are two key inputs, obviously. So when you put them into the simulation tools and you kind of churn them out and you extrapolate and end up with what we're going to go to the racetrack with, certainly we're all going to end up with a little bit different flavor at times, but it's no surprise that the group will tend to trend together on such a new platform because we just, we don't have any data to go off of yet. So if the data and the inputs are right, you're going to have a good week. And if they're wrong, you're going to have a bad one. So you, you put all the data in, it, it spits out the setups. And you go to the racetrack and you have a whopping 15 or 20 minutes of practice. Can you can you kind of describe how little that is or what little you can do to adjust at that point on a weekend? Well, I, while it is not, uh, it doesn't feel like it's near enough sometimes. It, it actually is more than, than what we would have had in a previous uh, generation car. We are able to change sway bar rates, which you wouldn't have been able to do in the, in the old car. The shocks are very modular, so you can change a lot of things there. But certainly can't change things like springs and nose weight and cambers. And you know, with this new 18-inch tire, you talk about cambers and toes. That's a that's a big part of what we do, as Todd knows. And you know, as you go to some of these racetracks for the first time, you can be married to something that you don't like, and in only that 15 to 20 minutes. You talk about that, and and we've we've seen it's the tire is wider, it's a bigger inside diameter, it's got a shorter sidewall. Uh, and you've got more freedom with the independent rear suspension as to what the targets can be in the rear. That that probably plays a little bit more into that game as well, right? 
It really does, Todd. And as you know, with a with a diffuser versus kind of the splitter being right against the ground, the the aero device, the 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 critical aero device of the car has really switched to the back, whereas so many years it's been in the front. And when you think about getting on the brakes and getting in these corners and how the cars pitch, that is a totally different way of thinking about racing. So it has been very interesting to go to these tracks for the first time and work through that. And with the travel limiting vice devices, trying to trying to preserve the floors and how critical that is to get all your heights right, it is a lot. And you talk about that, and we're coming up on Pocono this weekend, uh, 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 the tricky triangle. And, and I, I look at this place, a place that when we didn't think about shifting, we used to shift, a place that there's a huge bump in the tunnel that we've tried to address, but it, it seems like to me it was always that was a focus of where we got to and, and, and tire loads at this place. Are, are we, what challenges are we up against at Pocono this weekend? <laughs> Well, I can, I can tell you no different than many of the crew chiefs in the garage. I, I stay up a lot of nights thinking about left rear tire durability. So, and, and Pocono can be, will be no different. There'll be a lot of high speed, high load time spent on the straightaways. You get into those washboard bumps, getting into two there a little bit. And that, that left rear tire, while we're getting smarter about it and we're learning what, what our limits are and, and how to tune around it, it is still something I think a lot about uh, each and every week. Pocono will be no different. Certainly the shifting at Pocono, uh, these guys get in a rhythm. They've been doing it for a lot of years at Pocono. They know right where their shift points are going to be. That'll be a big story. Um, certainly no harder than some of these other tracks. You look at Loudon and these guys shifting two times a lap where they never had shifted there before. So certainly a lot of stuff uh, to pay attention to going into this weekend. So I, I, I was, I was talking to Blaney uh, Monday on, on the late shift and, uh, he he questioned whether they might be shifting at Bristol. We, we've talked a little bit about this. Denny's talked about the fact that shifting is hurt racing, and, I, and I'd agree with that on some of the short tracks. Martinsville seems like a lot going on to do that. Uh, what are your thoughts, and, and are there any solutions going forward? Well, it's funny you mentioned Bristol. Our, our, our guys in a, our crew chief meeting earlier this week, Bristol came up, and I said, surely to gosh, we will not be shifting at Bristol. I can't imagine how the drivers could be able to do that. So, um, I sure hope not. Uh, I, I do think, you know, shifting oval racing is largely momentum based and has been forever. You you put together a good set of corners. It carries on down the next straightaway. You make a run on a guy, get position on him. You make a pass and certainly shifting, allowing you to get down into the sweet spot of that torque band and the engine. If you make a mistake um, really has taken some of that nuance away. There's a lot of inside baseball as to go as to why that's happened. The uh, engine manufacturers have moved the RPM down a little bit, RPM target down a little bit for the 2022 season as well. So, so that coupled with the ratios that's been provided to us has, has really made it easier to get down there and grab a gear. And I think the industry is still trying to figure out kind of how to get rid of that and what it means for the sport. What what options would there be potentially to get rid of it? Is it that it, what options would there be, or what would you think would be a solution to that? Well, um, that's one of the things that that goes along with this next gen era and just trying to get enough inventory out to get to the racetrack, which we're now getting to. But once once you get over that hurdle, you can start looking at bigger spread and the ratios from from the primary ratio to the ratio that you would downshift to maybe even bumping the rpm target up at some of these races you mentioned martinsville earlier this year the the industry just flat out missed on the rpm target they they just didn't have enough rear gear in the car which makes shifting even more prominent so i think as we learn this car and and learn our capabilities with with i guess i would say parts up gear upgrades or different gear ratio selections uh you'll be able to get rid of some of that I, I think to a certain degree, you can't unlearn it either. So you may sh see shifting around to some degree for some time to come. As you, uh, you know, you're kind of a, in switching, switching gears here, but um, locked into the playoffs at Charlotte of all places in, in a year that, that's been challenging for you guys in, in some ways. Um, what do you need out of the rest of the regular season to prepare for the playoff run that, that, that inevitably you're, uh, you're trying to get to the final four? Yeah, the Coca Cola 600 win, man, that that was a huge one. It was a big one on on Denny's list. And you look at our two wins this year. Richmond is very very near and dear to Denny as well. So two big wins for us this year. 
a uh, couple that got away. We were so dominant at Dover and just made a couple mistakes that took us out of that race and had a great shot at Nashville. So really, I, I, we're starting to hone in on this car and what it takes. And our, our car potential is kind of where where I think it needs to be. we got to keep getting better, but I'm happy with where that's at. Really, it just comes down to execution for us. We just got to be consistent about putting races together. And we really need to use these next seven races to to get into playoff form or it's going to be a rough playoffs for us. <laughs> and with the inconsistency we've seen across the board this year, do you see the rounds of the playoffs playing playing differently? We I, I used to look at it as a first round. I just needed not to not to make a major mistake. I, I'd work my way through that round. And, and, um, and then you'd need to win as you got further along. Do you think that as the inconsistency we have, does consistency play a bigger factor later in the rounds? Uh, I think you're spot on, Todd. I think I think a team who can be steady and consistent is going to have a shot to go deeper without ne- necessarily excelling in any round. Uh, certainly the first two, I think if you can play clean and, and just land in the top 10 every race, you're going to easily move on. It's going to be very difficult. Um, obviously, uh, by the way, the year has played out and you guys are in for a treat, uh, Todd, I'm sure you are loving the side of the desk you are sitting on this year for that I reason. Am. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is cool stuff. Chris, I, what I always enjoy about chatting with you is you're kind of one of those guys I can talk to about, uh, about anything in the garage and you're, 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 you're just such a good source and you can explain things. Um, you mentioned the challenges at Dover, and the challenges at Dover put you on the sidelines. And those of us in the media call it vacation. You know, you're on vacation. Um, <laughs> sure. You're not on vacation. I understand that. I think we all understand that. But what? how does that work? What does that look like when you're home on a Sunday afternoon and your team is racing? Well, I mean, technology's come a long way, so it looks uh, a lot different now than it did 10 or 15 years ago. Um, you, you, you definitely are always working, uh, but the flexibilities of technology has made it a lot easier to integrate into the team throughout the weekend than you used to be able to, and even where you can do it from. So um, still very much involved, but I think Todd would tell you uh, the, key of, the key to building a really successful and sustainable team is that you can pull any one member out for for a week, two weeks, or three weeks, and the team will still find its way. Uh, you can't have a team that's so heavily dependent on one member that it can't succeed without it. And and that's what made me so proud of of my guys at the Coke 600. I just that is one of the biggest, very very biggest wins of my career, and I wasn't even there. <laughs> and it's it's because of how the team uh, was able to pull together and execute when it had to to win such a big race. And not that it's off the sidelines or or anything devious. And there's there's a very there's a very clear definition because I've been through it too, <laughs> of, <laughs> of of not being at the racetrack. Um, but there's a clear definition. You can't be at the racetrack, but and you can't be on the analog radio to the driver. But but there's still with like you talk about the ability to be on the pit box virtually is is still there for you. And I'm sure you had a major impact on the on the Coke 600. The 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 piece I found most challenging, and I don't know where that that's evolved, is is trying to get the track data back to me quick enough to be more involved. And, and that's that seemed like a challenge that, that we used to have. Is, is that still relevant for you guys? Is, is there a, a disconnect to the track? Um, it's something that is certainly there simply because you're not there to soak it in as it's happening with all the senses that you just take for granted. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just there soaking things in and you don't even realize through what mechanism. But you know, we've worked hard at, 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 el- at eliminating a lot of that. And as you know, Todd, just a few second delay can be very awkward to try to work through, uh, certainly where either pit calls are concerned or, or, you know, listening to your spotter versus watching what's going on. So, no, we're, we're getting smarter at it all the time, I feel like. And, and again, the versatility with which we can do it, I think, is, is um, I don't want to say it was a good experience it was an eye-opening experience and one that we were actually able to work through okay speaking of eye-opening experiences chris nascar this week announced that we are going to go street racing at chicago um and it's a long ways down the road so you'll have some time to get all your minds around this but just your general thought on street racing in chicago that we're going to do next year 
Uh, my first thought is, Todd, I got a hard card for you that weekend if you're interested. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you yeah. are, but I get you off the sidelines if you want. Uh -huh. uh, I, I don't, I, you know, road course racing is is not certainly my background. And now we're talking about a street race through through Chicago. I, I think just logistics is what comes to mind. Now, it's going to be exciting. I mean, golly, we look at that race at the L.A. Coliseum and all the unknowns that went into it, but I thought the, the the weekend was executed phenomenally, put on a great show. I'm actually excited to go back. Uh, I think our sport needs a lot more true short track racing, quarter to half mile racing. But you look at you you know you look at how well this industry executed the LA Coliseum, and you think of a street race in the streets of Chicago, and if we can execute it like we did there, I think it'll be a fantastic event. Yeah, what a what a what an opportunity to to have a meld of 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 the show yeah. that you saw at the LA Coliseum that, that had a little bit of everything for everybody and um, it'd be interesting to see how that all plays out um, with with the, the the virtual that they put up with inside walls and visibility uh, some of those right hand turns it, it'll be interesting to see how these drivers deal with it but <laughs> they are uh, they they do adapt they do adapt we thought that the Roval was going to be a disaster and it was turned out to be a pretty darn good race. There was a lot of talk about that uh, that race yeah. at the LA Coliseum, and um, I thought you guys put on a phenomenal show out there at LA. That was uh, that was incredible for the kickoff of the season. Yeah, I agree. And and one thing's for sure: at the end of that race in the streets of Chicago, they will wave a checker flag, hand out a trophy, and somebody will get the points. So <laughs> it's going to be exciting to see how we get from A to B for sure. But uh, but that that will be true. <laughs> you are darn right about that. That is for sure. And someone's going to walk out of there happy. Uh, no doubt about it. Um, final question for you here, uh, Chris. Uh, one of the other things I have so much respect for and just enjoy following along with you is your passion for the short tracks, your passion for the routes, your passion for super late model racing, the asphalt super late model racing. You tweeted something. It was around the SRX race. Bubba Pollard was in that race. And you tweeted... Uh, about, uh, and in the business model, I hope we can find again at our sports top level, his type of personality and talent, this Bubba, um, Bubba Pollard, that is, will find its way back in droves and secure a competitive health of our sport for many years to come. A, first off, I'm like, I'm wholeheartedly retweeting and agreeing with that, but are, are there things that, are there things that as a sport that you think that, that, that maybe we can, can can get to that model where a guy like Bubba Pollard can get an opportunity. Uh, I do. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly believe it. I think, I think our sport does a fantastic job of generating enough revenue to make that possible. It's just a matter of getting that allocated properly. And, you know, a lot of inside baseball here, but of course that's, that's a hot topic going into the next uh, year or two, as we move towards new contracts and, and securing the future of our sport. But if you look to other sports, you look to you look to NFL, you look to Major League Baseball, you look to soccer, you know, what stands between the the greatest kids in those particular sports and making it to the top level is simply their talent, their work ethic, their commitment, their desire. That's it. That's what stands between them. And right now in in the sport of auto racing as a driver, you certainly have to have all of those things. And there are plenty of examples of guys who do make it on that alone, but the barrier to entry is simply too difficult for our sport to sustain the stardom that we want to have and to get to where we want it to be. We have got to get it to where the sport's best drivers can make it on simply talent and work ethic. And uh, I can't speak highly enough to that. I think it's critical and I think the shows will get better. You know, when you, when you put the sports top, top uh, personalities and top talents in these cars and you let them go at it and you let them get out of the car and speak their mind because they're not worried about offending a sponsor or where their next paycheck is going to come from. You guys are going to have a lot more to talk about every Sunday and it's going to make the show even better. So I'm a big advocate of that and would love to help in any way I can. The thought of Bubba Pollard getting out of a cup car on the streets of Chicago and telling us what he thinks. I'll tell you what, I want to be holding the microphone for that one. Um, that, that is awesome. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I, it's great, great viewpoints and, and pieces when you when you draw the analogy to other sports, right? That 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 funding and sponsorship is so driven into our sport. It, it, it'd be great if we can get to the point where uh, yeah, where that's on the team side and not on the driver's side. Good stuff. Great stuff. 
Well, Chris, I'll tell you what. I always appreciate our visits and appreciate you joining us here today on Crew Call. Your insight into where you guys are at this year and your insight in the sport in general is always uh, respected and appreciated. And uh, we appreciate you joining us here today. Thanks for having me, guys. I'd be glad to help out anytime. I enjoy it. There we go. That is Chris Gabart, crew chief up at Joe Gibbs Racing, that number 11 car for Denny Hamlin here in 2022. See, I got my numbers all figured out now. You got it figured out. Got it figured out. Stay with us more in just a moment. <laughs> Welcome back. It is Crew Call presented by Flow Racing. So glad that you have joined us. And uh, wow, so glad to talk to Chris Gabehart. I'm telling you, he's he's always been one of my go-to guys, and he's a go-to guy here on Crew Call. Great, great conversation. Yeah, great conversation. Explaining some of the challenges that this car has brought to the to the sport um, and where they've gotten to, uh, you know, with what the challenges are with, with whether it be you know, going to Pocono this weekend with tire durability, you know, explaining some of that. Um, you know, the, the, where this car has gotten to, I love his outlook on short track racing and, yeah. and, and where we can evolve the sport to going forward. That's, I really hadn't thought of it that way, but what a great insight. I have always wanted that. I've always wanted the talent to be the predeterminant. And I had not really thought about it from the perspective of, uh, face it, the reality of it is this is, this is the inside baseball party talked about, right? We are in a negotiation period with a television contract that will likely be very, very lucrative. Yes. Okay? Yeah. So let's figure out. We're in a great spot to figure this out. I love the fact that he's he's not only thinking about it. We all want that. But he's actually thinking about the solution to it and how do we take some of those funds and allocate it. And that's that's the thing is, is that when you look at anything, don't just bring up the challenges. Bring up the solutions, right? Yeah. And we talked about even to the point, and that's a great piece there on, on the driver letting the talent be what gets there. And the other piece, we talked about short track racing and, and shifting. And, and we know Dan, Denny is, has been yeah. vocal about yeah. thinking it's not, it's not good for it. I, I agree with him in certain places. I don't think we need to shift it at Martinsville. And I think there are things you can do to that. And, and he talked about the solutions to it, you right. know, sp Absolutely. Sp spreading the gear ratios apart. Um, we did that prior. We had a, a higher minimum third gear at mm -hmm. some of the short tracks to take the shifting away. So, there's solutions out there, and NASCAR's done a great job with this. Right. And the industry has done a great job with this. So um, for them, this is the first year. They're going to get through sure. it, and then it'll be interesting to see how they react to these things as we go forward into 2023. More of the fine-tuning elements, the little details of it. Yeah. Getting to the track was a challenge. Now it's now it's getting there. I mean, this is an A effort for everybody in, in NASCAR and the team side of bringing a brand-new race car to yeah. the racetrack, and, and it's put on some great racing. I think overall, kudos to everybody in the industry that's put this together. But I, they're not going to sit on their laurels with this. They're, they're going to no. say, okay, what do we see out of this year? And, and how can we adjust that going forward? I appreciate the not the knee-jerk reaction immediately, yeah. but a thoughtful execution. Yeah. And, and people like Chris will help drive the industry to, to make it even better. Absolutely. No doubt about it. One of the other challenges he talked about is Pocono this weekend. We're going to bring the old crew chief up onto the uh, the MRN pit box. You get to join us up there. Yes. Not only the challenges that Chris laid out with the car, with the with the, with the the left rear tire, with the, the bumps in turn number two, um, you know, what is, what is, just what are the concerns as far as the car goes? Uh, then we get into the always critical at Pocono strategy. Yes. Um, it's going to be a fun, fun weekend. Another place that you can pit and not lose a lap. So the opportunity short of uh, short of, of the stage breaks to, to pit with three to go, or if you're close enough to the leader, you might pit with two to go if you can get to the, you know, the right. leader or, or following the leader down pit road. So uh, there's opportunities there to do some different things. Shifting every corner. Yeah. Uh, might not be in fifth gear on all the straightaways. I, I, there's so much going on this weekend. And Pocono has been a place that shifting in the past has made the racing really good. Um, downshift, that that restarts into turn one with yeah. this car, with the brakes we've got on this car. We used to see five wide. I, I don't know how you make it more than that, but I think it will be. Is there any concern about the brake packages? Are we gonna Are we going to push those to the limit as well, or we think we might... What's your thought? The only, th the only question I have on a brake package piece is that, you know, that they talked a little bit a few weeks back about shock cooling. At Road America. Yes. Right. And in, in, in a, another place, well, this is the longest straightaway we've got in 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 oval in any oval racing in NASCAR. That front straightaway is is what 
It's yeah. 3,500 feet or I, I don't know. It's, it seems like it's forever in a mile. Um, but the brakes would be pretty cool and go into a pretty heavy braking zone. Yeah. It's that shock. It's that cold to hot. Yeah. We ran into that at Road America and the driver uh, during practice and they were just told, make sure you keep some heat in the brake. I don't know how you keep some heat in the brake when you're coming down that long straightaway. I, I don't know about Especially it. Especially when you're drafting and trying to make all the speed you yeah, can. You can't drag your brake pedal going down <laughs> through those straightaways. So I, I don't know if that'll be an issue, but I'm sure it's something that they've learned out of Road America what what we need to do going into uh, into Pocono here. And, and and Chris talked a little bit about it, the, the left rear tire yeah. durability challenges. And I don't know that everybody understands that as well. These cars, and he talked about, you know, the aero device is now on the back. On the back. So it's aero, it's and, back And sensitive. you want that back, you want that diffuser to sit as close to the ground as possible. If you could drag the ground with it, you would. And, and that's where NASCAR was, is they had these rub blocks and everybody was just going to rub the rub blocks off of them. So then they had to go internal to the shocks and right. create a stop. Right. And that, that there's, there's basically the shock bottoms out. And these guys run down the straightaways with a shock just about bottomed out. And any bumps in it, it does bottom out, and that spikes load in these tires. So a different environment for Goodyear to have to deal with and a lot of, of load that, that you see into this left rear tire that's got a lot of load on it to start with just because of cross weight and pieces like that. We used to have the left front doing that, right? but the left front was the lightest loaded tire of the, of the car, so it could deal with it. And, and it's a bigger challenge for these guys now. Now it's, now it's so much driven off that rear end of yes. that car, and then that left rear takes, takes it even like a double whammy with it. With Be the, interesting. With the... and, and when we've seen tire issues, it's been on cars that are leading races. It's right. not been <laughs> on. <laughs> there's a reason why. There's, there's a balance, right? Yeah. Performance is there, but you're right again against the edge. Be interested to watch. We can't wait to have you join us up there in the booth, and MRN is going to be busy all weekend long. Our coverage from Pocono starts at 6.30 on Friday afternoon, Friday evening, the General Tire 200 for the Arkham Menard Series. We have triple header broadcasts on Saturday. 11.30 a.m., the CRC Break Clean 200 for the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series. 2.30, it is the NASCAR Cup Series Practice and Qualifying. And at 4.30, Explore the Pocono Mountains 225 NASCAR Xfinity Series. And then Sunday, 2 o'clock, M&M's Fan Appreciation 400 for the NASCAR Cup Series. Can't wait. It's going to be a fun weekend in the Pocono Mountains. Yeah, going to be a great weekend. Uh, looking forward to getting up there and, and, and being part of that. Hope to get there for cup, uh, the Cup show on Saturday and and, uh, and tune on from there. There we go. Sounds great. That is for sure. He is Todd Gordon. I am Steve Post. We appreciate Chris Gabehart for joining us. This is Crew Call presented by Flow Racing, the ultimate digital home track for race fans everywhere. Whether it's dirt, asphalt, drag, off-road, you'll find it more at flowracing.com. Thanks for joining us, everyone.